So in this talk, we're going to look at the language of the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible. So in particular, that's the Hebrew language. So my name is Ewan MacLeod, and just let me just start by giving you a few indications of why I chose this particular subject. So Hebrew is very important to me. I was baptised as a Christel Christadelphian in 1990, and I knew that the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, was translated from Hebrew. So that means that the translations that we use, such as the ESV, the King James, and so on, were translations rather than from the original Word of God, Hebrew and the Old Testament. So I always wanted to learn Hebrew, and in 1992 I worked in Israel for most of the summer, learned a little bit of Hebrew that way. In 1993 I saved up to go to Israel kind of full time, so I'd started by doing a six-month intensive Hebrew language school, it's called an Olpan in Netanya in 1994, and I then worked in Israel for about a further five years after that. And I learned Biblical Hebrew and Modern Hebrew, comparing the two, and I've really continued to learn it ever since. So that means that I'm in a quite a unique position of being able to look at what Hebrew offers when you start to look at it more than just a translation, but into the language that God delivered his word in. So let's just think a little more about that. Hebrew is not just any language. It didn't evolve systematically through caveman grunts and becoming a more sophisticated language. Instead, just as Adam and Eve were created in the Old Testament, they were created with a language that they could speak right from day one. And so the Hebrew language was given to them to speak. It's the language that God chose to reveal himself in. He chose to give it to Adam and Eve as an ability. And his word, the Old Testament, is given in the Hebrew language. God chose this language. So in that sense, Hebrew is the holy language. It's the language of the Hebrew Bible in which God or Yahweh is chose to reveal his word in. Therefore, every word, every letter is perfect, it's inspired. But more than just God choosing to reveal his words, in ancient times Hebrew was given in the Garden of Eden, but against all odds, Hebrew once again has resurrected itself as a national language for the Jewish people. And we'll have a look at that and see that it's very significant that the Jews, in fulfilment of Bible prophecy, are not just returning back to the land, but they're speaking that Hebrew language again. I believe this is a prelude to, once again, the Hebrew being the spoken language on the earth and against a, a huge number of people and God sending his son back to establishing his kingdom. So let's just look a little bit at that idea that there's a creation and that language was formed as part of creation. So we know from Genesis that God created the earth in six days and rested in the seventh. So that means that evolution isn't possible, that God systematically chose little changes over time. So language was created along with Adam and Eve in order to allow them to speak, to speak to each other and to speak to God. And everything about people shows that that's the case. First of all, we have a brain that not only can understand language, but actually has the ability to understand grammar. Even young children systematically understand the grammar of their mother tongue without being taught it. We have ears that can somehow, we still don't fully understand how, but take sound patterns, which is voice and words going through a continuous stream of words and break that down into words. And we have tongues and throats and teeth and everything else that can form words. And that means together, if we read a word, if you read God's word, God can effectively implant thoughts into our head directly through the reading of his word, which is an amazing concept when you think about it. And if we hear the word of God, our whole brain and ears and tongue and everything else is able to understand that speech or the written word. And this is not something that can evolve slowly over time. Instead, it has to be systematically given to us as an instinct and an ability on, you know, from creation onwards. And just to show you that Hebrew is a language that was originally spoken, there's a lot of research into this. There's a book called The Origin of Speeches, which is a play on The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, showing that all the world's languages really have to go back to a common ancestor, which I believe is the Hebrew language has given in the early chapters of Genesis. And there's a very fascinating book called The Word, which is a dictionary that, that reveals that even words like English words go back to a Hebrew original. There are many thousands of words 
in this book, which are English words, and yet they go back to words and concepts in Hebrew just to demonstrate that point. So then if Hebrew comes from God, then the Hebrew Bible also comes from God. The Hebrew Bible itself is, a, is God's revelation to mankind. And obviously that's the New Testament as well. And it's interesting that God's word in the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible is actually very simple to understand. Grammatically, it's very simple sentences. So, for example, you have in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. A nice, simple grammatical sentence It's broken down into parts that you can understand. If you take the next verse, um, you know, the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Again, it's a very simple language that you can understand grammatically. If you go to the New Testament, the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, so that the grammar, the language, the structure of the Bible is very simple. Some of the concepts can be difficult, prophecy and so on. But God has given his word in a language that's given to be understood grammatically and also to be translated. So even if you translate the scriptures, it's still possible to understand it, even though sometimes it may go through multiple translations. But there are many other features in the Bible that show that it can't just be the word of man. It has to be the word of God directly. So let's just look at a few of those. If you take the very simplest uh, verse in scripture, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the very first verse of the Bible, it's a nice simple verse to understand and yet there is a, a divine richness and integrity about this verse that you wouldn't know if you didn't look at the Hebrew behind it. So the creation is about um, seven days, six days God created and in the seventh he rested. And then this verse, there's therefore patterns of seven running all through the verse. So, for example, there's seven words in the verse. If you look at the number of letters, there's a combination of seven, seven times four. If you look at the first half of the verse, in the beginning God created, that in itself has a combination of seven letters. If you look at the, the next four words, the last four words, it also has 14 letters or seven times two. If you go on to look at other ways to look at to slice and dice this verb verse in other ways we see it's also got patterns of seven so the subject and the object the heavens and the earth they're also patterns of seven running through those if you divide the main subjects like god the heaven and the earth it also has 14 letters amazingly if you look at the numerical value of those letters not just the the number that also adds up to multiple of seven or seven 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 so we can go through, through this in more detail, but almost every way that you can think of splitting the verse up and slicing it and dicing it, whether it's the number of letters or numerical values of the letters or the positions of the letters, it adds up to multiple of seven. And there's actually 14 different ways you can work out a pattern of seven in this verse. And 14 itself, of course, is seven times two. So it's amazing that even in a simple verse, there's patterns of seven appearing in ways that man could not possibly have devised. And yet it also makes perfect sense. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's like a divine signature running through the whole of scripture. And you can also, we can go further and see that there's patterns of four and three in this verse. And four and three, when you add them together, is also seven. So even just the, the starting off verse in scripture has some amazing and miraculous things about it. But there's many other fascinating things about the Hebrew Bible in which God has given it to us. If you look at that first book, Genesis, the, the word Torah is very important. The Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they are the law or what the Jews call the Torah. So that word Torah in Hebrew is actually spelled out every 50 letters in the book of Genesis. And 50, of course, is important because it's the, the Jubilee. If we go on to the next book, Exodus, exactly the same thing happens where the word Torah is spelled out. Again, it's like God is putting his divine signature into the books of Genesis and Exodus. Something interesting happens in the next book. This next book, Leviticus, is all about God. It's all about Yahweh in Hebrew, which is the Hebrew name for God. And in this verse, by contrast, every eight letters spells out Yahweh. So it's interesting patterns of 
Torah being spelt out, the law, patterns of Yahweh being spelt out, and so on. So man couldn't have devised these things if you if it wasn't given by by God. If you look at everything else in scripture, so for example, the name of people and places, they only make sense in Hebrew. No other language, not, not Latin, not Aramaic, not Greek, only Hebrew. So for example, Genesis chapter 3, where Adam and Eve are named, their names, Adam and Eve, only make sense in Hebrew. It comes across as a very strange verse in English that Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Eve only makes sense in Hebrew. And if you go on to look at other names like Cain and Abel and Seth and Noah, all of those common names have an explanation, but the explanation only makes sense in Hebrew. Equally, you can look at the 12 tribes of um, 12 tribes of Israel and just about every other name in Hebrew. You can look at place names like Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Bethany, Kadesh Barnea, Kiryath Sefer, all of those names really only make sense in the Hebrew language. So God has given his word in Hebrew and yet allowed it to be translated. There's many acrostics in the Hebrew Bible, such as um, Proverbs 31 or Psalm 119. So in Proverbs 31, this is about the woman of valor. And from verse 10 onwards, Every verse is the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which you can see here in a slightly different colour. So it's like it's spelled out A, B, C, D, E, F, G, up to Z, if it had been in English. And this means that we can memorise these verses. It's easier to remember something where there's a, a prompt for the next word. In Psalm 119, it's slightly different. Here, every group of eight verses starts with the same letter. So A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 C. And so you can start to see how, again, this is given to, to memorise those verses. In some translations, you'll find each of these sections separated out with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And there are many other Psalms that similarly have acrostics. So this is probably a way for God to encourage us to memorise his word. And in fact, Psalm 119 talks about that very thing of guarding God's word in our heart and preserving it in our heart and committing it to memory. But there's many other even more fascinating things in scripture. Scripture has numerical prophecies almost of individual words. So here is one from Joel, for example, where there's a series of invasions by a palmer worm, a locust, a canker worm and a caterpillar. And they're probably all life stages in the life of a locust, you know, from the early stages through to the swarming stages and through to the eating stages and so on. So you can see it's a, a series of terrible catastrophes happening to the land of Israel. And yet prophetically, these actually have prophetic meaning according to the numerical values of the Hebrew words that are used. So Hebrew letters can also have a number associated with them. So it's a little bit like A is one and B is two and so on. So each of these Hebrew words spells out a number and God has given it so that the very words themselves, the numerical equivalent of them, actually give you the number of years that each of those world empires came against Jerusalem. So Gazam, the first word is 50 and it was 50 years of Babylonian dominion over Jerusalem until the time of Nebuchadnezzar from 588 to 538. Or the next word, Arbe, is 208 is the numerical value of it. And that demonstrates the Persian Empire, where it was 208 years from the time of dominion of Jerusalem right up until Alexander the Great. And that then was the Greek Empire. And the next word, Yelek, is 140, which is the time of Greek or Seleucid dominion of Jerusalem from BC 330 to 190, when the Maccabees came along under the Maccabean revolt. And then Chasil is the last word, 108, and the Roman dominion of Jerusalem lasted 108 years from BC 38 to AD 70, when Jerusalem was destroyed. So in the very names themselves and the numerical values of those letters, God has given it so that they're actually prophecies of, 
of how long those four empires would come against Jerusalem. It's incredible. Man could not possibly have devised this or written it. And there's many other, literally hundreds and hundreds of puns and plays on words that give God's word a beauty and a depth that you wouldn't see just from a translation itself. So in Proverbs chapter 25, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honour of kings is to search out a matter. So there are literally many hundreds of plays on words in Hebrew in the Old Testament that you wouldn't be aware of just from reading the translation alone. Even the New Testament has got these numerics running through as if it's a like a divine signature to tell you that God is in control and Hebrew is a language that he's delivering his word in. So, for example, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 17, it talks about the number of generations, and it's 14 generations from Abraham to David. From David to Babylon is also 14, and from the carrying away to Babylon to Christ, to the Messiah, are also 14. So there's patterns of 14 running through, all associated with David. And in the Hebrew, it just so happens that the word David, David, the numerical value of that, adds up to 14. So it's a kind of divine play on words between the meaning of David's name and the numerical value adding up to 14. Or if you look at John chapter 21, when Jesus appears to the disciples and they catch a huge amount of fish, it says Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fish and 150 and three. And for all these were so many, yet was not the net broken. So 153 fish sounds like it's a, a strange number, doesn't really mean anything at first glance. And yet the numerical value for the phrase B'nai Elohim, which is the sons of God, adds up to 153. So there's a kind of parable in here that the number of fish caught is effectively the sons of God. It's an allegory for what Simon Peter was told, you know, I'll teach you to become fishers of men. And he then goes out after the resurrection and he starts to preach and to bring people into the truth as if that dragnet, the parable of the dragnet, he's acting it out and pulling people in to an understanding of the scripture. So the 153 is a symbol for the sons of God who are being caught in the preaching mission. Or just the final example, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18 this is the famous 666 that many people will have heard of. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, and his number is 600, three score and six, or 666. And in Hebrew, there's a numerical name of that, and also in Greek and Latin. So there's a, a triple play on languages in this verse, including Hebrew, which identifies the beast system that Revelation chapter 13 talks about, which no doubt we'll talk about in other um, discussions and talks at Mumbles. So what does all this mean? Well, miraculously, God hasn't just revealed his word in Hebrew and then left it out there for people to find. There's a reason why his word is in Hebrew. Hebrew is associated with the Jewish people down through many, many centuries. And for a long time, after about AD 70, and also the Bar Kokhba revolt, Hebrew kind of almost stopped being a, a spoken language. Aramaic took over. Hebrew was still used maybe for Jewish literature down through thousands of years. But in the 1800s, a really dramatic event happened that's never been repeated before and won't be repeated after, no doubt, where Eliezer ben Yehuda managed to almost single-handedly resurrect the Hebrew language and in his lifetime, in just one generation, managed to get all the Jews that were in the land to start speaking Hebrew. And that was an event that kick-started Hebrew being spoken in the land. Eliezer ben Yehuda had an astonishing knowledge of Hebrew down through the millennia. He managed to single-handedly revive the Hebrew as a spoken language, not just as a literary language, not a religious language, but actually spoken with real words being added. He created hundreds of new words that just seamlessly integrated with Hebrew down through time. And he turned it into a national language that was spoken by, by the Jews who were in the land. 
This is an incredible feat that's never been accomplished. So, for example, we have many Welsh speakers who would love Welsh to once again be the dominant language of Wales, but it's never happened. Or in Cornwall, in England, there's many people who still speak an ancient Cornish language, never managed to resurrect it in order to make it a national language. And there are dozens and dozens of languages down through the centuries that have drifted off into the graveyard of history. Only Hebrew has been single-handedly resurrected. And there's a reason for that. There are many miracles associated with the, the resurrection of Israel and Israel as a nation. And there was four miracles just at this very time in just a few short decades that together allowed the Jews to go back to their land and have Hebrew as a spoken language. So we've looked at the miracle of Eliezer ben Yehuda reviving Hebrew. There's the extraordinary wealth of the Rothschilds who had literally trillions or the equivalent of trillions of dollars to their name. And they managed to use some of that money to start to kickstart Israel or industries in Israel, such as wine building and bottle making and so on, clearing malarial swamps for the Jews to go back to. And then there was Jewish political Zionism, where the Jews wanted a land to go back to, combining at the same time with Christian Zionism, where people like Laurel, Lord Balfour managed to arrange Jews to go back to their land under the protection of the British. So there was four miracles together at these very close few decades in 1800s and early 1900s that allowed the Jews to go back to their land and for Hebrew once again to be a spoken language just as it had been in the land of Israel when the Jews were there in Roman times and before that. But there's a reason for all this. All these things together, Jews returning back to their land, the United Nations agreeing for once to allow the Jews to go back to their land, Hebrew becoming a national language again, the state of Israel being formed, you know, wars with the Arabs where Jerusalem managed to be captured by Israel. All these things are starting to come into place where Jews and Gentiles together start to accept their Messiah, where Jesus will return to establish the kingdom of God in Israel, in the land of Israel, and Hebrew will once again be the spoken language of the whole world. For example, the, the national anthem, anthem of Israel is called Hatikva. It means the hope, and it's the hope of Israel, where once again Jews will come back to their land, the land of Zion and the land of Israel, and they will speak Hebrew again, and they'll once again be feet planted in the land of Israel. And it says in the national anthem that this has been the hope of 2,000 years, and yet now in these latter few generations, this has actually happened. And there's a reason why it's happened, because God is shortly going to establish his kingdom upon this earth, where Jerusalem is the universal holy city. And this is spoken about in many passages in scripture, but here in, for example, Isaiah chapter 2 that the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Israel, a house of, house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is a verse that's talking about the whole world being centered around Jerusalem and from Jerusalem goes forth the law. It's the setting up of the kingdom of God from Jerusalem. And so these events will shortly come to pass. So there's a reason why Hebrew is once again being the spoken language in the land of Israel, because it's a forerunner of these events. And we actually find an indication that Hebrew once again will be the spoken language of all the world's population in these verses here in Zephaniah which also talk about that coming age. It says in the part in red, 
For then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. And that previous verse, verse 8, is an interesting verse. It contains all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. But not only that, Hebrew letters have a final form, a different form, when they appear at the end of the word. And this verse also contains all those final forms. So it's a, a special verse that indicates that Hebrew will be the spoken language at that time. So when we see God's word and the language that God has used to deliver his word in Hebrew, we see that this is no ordinary language. It's the holy language. It's the language of the Hebrew Bible, of the Old Testament. God allows us to, to read this in our own language, in a translation. And yet if we read it in Hebrew, there's a, a beauty and a power behind it that we often might miss in a translation. God can directly give thoughts into our minds by allowing us to read his word in either Hebrew or a language of the translation. He can effectively implant thoughts into our mind if we read his word. So if we start to read the scriptures and they come alive to us, we can start to understand what God wants from us. And that's our hope here at the Mumbles Christadelphians, that you'll start to read these talks and hear these talks and think about them. But more importantly, to hear God's word, to listen to God's word, to read it for yourself and to seek to understand what God tells us in the scriptures of truth.